Tes 1, 2 Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Good morning everyone, ladies and gentlemen Let me begin by giving you a warm welcome In the physics department of Universitas Gajah Mada First of all, I would like to give a big gratitude for the presence of our distinguished guest, Honorable the Head of Physics Department, Dr. Edi Suaryadi, Honorable Mr. Arif, Mr. Safrianto, and the team of Novatec Integra Solusindo, Honorable the main presenter, Mr. Mike Paluga from Fritz, Germany, Honorable the lecturer, researcher, students, and also all the participants for today's seminar, both joining on offline in this room and online via YouTube live streaming. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Adinandra Cesar Fahrudin. It is a great honor for me to be a moderator for today's seminar. Before we before we start, let first give an attention to the opening report. The first one will be given by Head of Physics Department. Please welcome Dr. Edi Suaryadi. The time is yours. Ya, selamat pagi. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Mac. Okay, uh, on behalf of the Department of Physics, uh, Universitas Gajah Mada, uh, I would like to say thank you very much for your coming. And I think this is uh, a very great opportunity for us uh, to uh, listen and, and study a lot, lot of things from, from you, both particle size analyzer from FRIS. Uh, because there are, yes, uh, we have lot of uh, student and also uh, professor and associate professor who are working in the nanoparticles, nanostructure and nanomaterials. And I think the one of most important thing for, for the in the nanostructure, uh, how to analyze the particles. And unfortunately we, uh, for example, uh, PSA, so some student have to send the Sample to the another uh, university, uh, for example, for time analysis, and from the time uh, we analyze the particle size. So that's why I think this uh, morning in this today session uh, we can study a lot of things from you, and also there are PSA over there. Uh, hopefully, uh, we can order next time. <laughs> And no need for our student and for our researcher to send the sample to analyze the particle size for the nanoparticles. Yeah, maybe as you know, uh, most uh, student here and most uh, faculty members here, uh, when they are working on the nanoparticles or nanomaterials, we have only a temp image to analyze the nanoparticles. Uh, to, analyze to analyze the particle, the particle size. size. Yeah. yeah, we have, we some, have problem. some problem. For example, for it's difficult to find the boundary. boundary. So that's why uh, we, you are, we you get, get the particle, particle size, size not so uh, precisely. precisely. So I think so the I think PSA is one of the equipment to uh, present the particle size uh, precisely. Hopefully, uh, from this uh, session, session? Uh, Mostly the student from the grade, from the PhD and master student, uh, learn a lot of things about the particle size analysis. And not only the equipment, but also how to uh, explain how to analyze the particle size. So I think that's all. And thank you again, Max, uh, for your coming in Indonesia. Uh, I know uh, you have limited time in Indonesia. Yeah. Otherwise, Otherwise uh, we can invite you, invite you to, to explore Jogjakarta, Jogjakarta. <laughs> because, uh, because Jogjakarta, Jogjakarta is the, the I think top I think two top after two. Bali. Bali. You know, Bali, Bali is the most, is the most uh, popular, popular uh, for tourism, tourism destination, and the second, the second one is Jogjakarta. One is Jogjakarta. So maybe from, from Inovatec can, can uh, ask Mike to explore, explore Jogjakarta. Jogjakarta. <laughs> if he, they he already the, took care of that. So. Oh, okay, okay. I was. <laughs> We have some spare time tomorrow. Ah, okay. <laughs> ah, Morapia, we have also Prambanan, Borobudur Temple, the, the largest temple in the world. Uh, and also 
some dance, some traditional dance, 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 well, floating, and also yes. we have the Kraton uh, Kingdom, Kingdom Place, place over there. there. Uh, actually, Yogyakarta is a special place in Indonesia. Yeah, hopefully you can enjoy here. The temple sounds nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, Gajah Mada, University of Gajah Mada is, uh, yeah, we can say the, the top university, uh, QS, QS ranking version. Uh, we, uh, maybe within five years, we are the top. Uh, and the second one, the second one is, is ITB in, in Bandung and also Universitas Indonesia in Jakarta. In, in Jakarta. Jakarta. Maybe, Maybe uh, Pak Siapa tadi nama? Uh, Sapri, we can, you so you can invite Mike also to the uh, UI and also ITB. Yes. Ah, okay, it's very nice for for friends. <laughs> yeah. Thank you again, Mike. Terima kasih Pak Sapri atas kehadirannya. Uh, enjoy teman-teman semuanya, mahasiswa, dosen untuk mengikuti acara pada pagi hari ini. Selamat pagi. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you to Dr. Edi Suharyadi for the opening remarks. And the next one, we will hear the opening remarks from Novatec Integra Solusindo to Mr. Safrianto. The time is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I, uh, I will deliver my speech in Indonesian. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Uh, pertama-tama, marilah kita uji. Kita uji. Karanya, karanya. Berkat bantuan dari uh, jurusan fisika ya Pak, uh, Kajamada University, uh, kami bisa menampilkan produk ini ke Bapak Ibu sekalian. Uh, rencana kami memang melakukan. Jadi bukan hanya di Jogja, kita akan keliling ke center-center uh, universitas yang memiliki uh, sebagai leadernya, Pak. Contoh mungkin di Surabaya, Unair, kita coba Jakarta, UI, Bandung, ITB, gitu. Akan bergilir. Um, uh, saya mewakili PT Novatek Integra Solusindo. Distributor tunggal di Indonesia mengucapkan banyak terima kasih Pak atas kesempatannya yang diberikan. Semoga hari ini kita keluar lebih produk yang kami tampilkan sekarang sebagai informasi tambahan. Novatek ini juga kita mengageni alat-alat FTIR, Raman, NIR, banyak alat-alat teknologi lainnya yang mungkin bukan hal ini tentunya dengan teknologi yang berbeda. Uh, kami berharap bisa tinju sehingga kita bisa bukan hanya menjual tapi juga mengedukasi uh, customer-customer kita dengan teknologi-teknologi yang terbaru. Uh, kira-kira itu uh, pembukaan dari kami. Uh, semoga apa yang bisa disampaikan Mr. Mike Paluga ini bisa menjadi tambahan ilmu untuk Bapak Ibu sekalian. Uh, Oke. Okay. Terima kasih dan selamat menikmati acara ini. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you to Mr. Safrianto for the opening remarks. Along with this, I'm proudly presented to you the seminar entitled Particle Size Analyzer Fritz Instrument and Application. This seminar will be divided into two sessions. The first session from 9 to 12 this morning, we will get the presentation from Mr. Mike Paluga about the introduction of the instrument. After that, we will take a short break for about an hour, and then we, we are going to have the second session to a workshop with the instrument, namely PSA Analyzed 22 Next Nano. I encourage. I encourage all of the participants to join the whole session today so everyone can get more detail and also have a hands-on experience about the instrument. I believe this will be a valuable opportunity for us to learn directly from the, from the experts. But first, let's greet our special guest. Good morning, Herr Mike Paluga, welcome in Yogyakarta. Uh, it is our pleasure to have you here. So, but before we begin, let's let me give a brief introduction about, about our main presenter. 
Dr. Ma Her My Mr. Mike Paluga pursue his Bachelor of Science and Master of Science in Physics from University of Paderborn in Germany. He is currently a product specialist particle sizing in Fritz. For those of you who don't know what Fritz is, so Fritz is an international manufacturer of application-oriented laboratory instrument based in Germany. Their instrument have been used for decades worldwide for sample preparation and particle sizing in industry and research laboratories. Their products include Myling, Shift Shaker, Ultrasonic Cleaner, as well as particle sizers. For more information, you can visit their website in www.fritz-international.com. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Mike Paluga. You may start your presentation. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, guten Morgen. Uh, also, I would like to thank you very much, all the attendees here. Uh, it's a quite big number of people, which makes me very happy. So thank you for that. Also, thank you uh, for hosting this. Thank you to UGM. And of course, another thank you goes out to um, Zaprianto and Dynatech for organizing this whole event here. Um, normally, I would start with introducing myself. Uh, but that was very well done already. So um, my name is Mike Paluga, as said. I'm the product specialist at Fritsch Milling and Sizing in Germany for the optical instruments. Uh, we will talk today, as already mentioned, about particle size. And this sounds very simple in the beginning when we talk about size. You will see within the next 45 to 60 minutes that sometimes the things that sound very simple on first glance are actually, when you dive a little bit deeper into it, not that simple anymore. You can get a small glimpse of this here on the first slide. Here we see uh, four different kinds of particles. Um, some of the, those pictures are taken under the electron microscope. So what you already see, there is a big difference. If you just compare these and these, um, Looks quite different, and I should maybe shift back to this slide at the very end and then ask you the question, what do you think, which is the easiest to measure? Uh, so maybe you remind me of that to go back to this slide then and ask you that question. I'm curious to see what your answer uh, to this question would then be. So particle sizing itself is, of course, a very, very wide field. We can Particles are everywhere. I mean, basically, we are made of particles, if you will. Uh, so also, the application which we can use with our instrument is so wide, I cannot present you everything. Yeah? This whole presentation will basically just give you a glimpse and some basics, and I also, also chose one field as an example. Uh, this doesn't mean that this is the only one. It can be really anything that you can go with uh, with this instrument. That's not only for the application, also the instrument itself. I will just present uh, mainly one way uh, of doing it. But of course, as mentioned, we have the uh, time also for questions. So I rely on you a little bit to maybe ask questions, and this might get us to some further applications, to some further opportunities how we can use such an instrument. So the application I chose here to give you a short introduction into the field would be mining. The reason why I chose mining is because in mining you actually have the uh, need for such an instrument on both ends of the process. What do I mean with this? So first of all, what happens in mining? They break ores out of the earth. So Mainly, they are looking, of course, for a certain material. May it be gold or iron or rare earth. It's always some specific material you're looking for. Unfortunately, it's not just there on the ground purely, but it's in the earth and it's um, mixed with other minerals. So the challenge is to extract it. How do you extract it? You basically take the material which you mine from the earth and then you grind it down into smaller particles. And the very, very big thing here is you just want to grind as far until you reach particles which are made of a single material. So basically the material which you are looking for. Let's say gold ore. So you grind it as far that the materials or that the particles are 
purely gold, nothing else. Of course, you don't want to go any further then. You want to go exactly to that step to make the whole process very efficient because, of course, every mining company needs profit. And the more efficient you can do this process, the better your profit will be. Um, as I said, if you reach the right particle size in this process, this means higher efficiency and this means a lower cost. Now, at the end of this whole process, if we look at the lifetime of such a mine, at some point it will be finished, okay? The material will be done. And it might not be the big issue if you go somewhere on, on uh, Papua Island in the middle of the forest. Uh, it is not a big deal, but for example, we also have coal mines in Germany. And, um, there, once you're done and you dig the big hole, you have to fill it again. Yeah, you can't just leave such a big hole somewhere. We have limited space there. So this is called backfill in the mining industry. And the backfill is very important that you fill this mine in a way that it doesn't um, crash down after a couple of years. And here again, in order to be stable, what you need is the right particle size of the backfill material. So once again, you have to use a kind of particle sizer. You have to know the size of your particles in order to make this process as safe and uh, as smooth as possible. So that's why I chose this. Here you have basically qu quality control of the particle size on both ends of the spectrum, yes? Nonetheless, I often get asked the question, uh, what is the ap typical application? And my usual answer, although it's not a very satisfying an answer is, it can be anything, and it's actually true. It can be anything. I have colleagues um, back at Fritsch, uh, my main colleague, Dr. Gunther Crawley, he works um, almost 20 years, or my boss, he works since 20, 27 years for us, and even for them, uh, sometimes a new application comes up which they have never heard of, they have no experience with, and that really happens frequently, especially to me also. I'm now at the company for three and a half years, so uh, a new application, a new sample, something I've never seen before, uh, that happens basically every month, okay? Uh, just to give you an idea how, how big of a range these things can be. But talking about the quality control and the size difference. So I, I call this slide, uh, size difference is relative, okay? Let's assume staying with the mining, that we grind our ore or our material down to a size of 10 micrometers. Yes, so we have one particle that is 10 micrometers. Uh, might be we only grind it to 20 micrometers. So this difference doesn't seem all that big to have the 10 micrometer, 10 micrometer diameter compared to the 20 micrometer diameter. This is just a factor of two. So nothing so severe at first glance. You can see it also here in the picture. It doesn't really seem uh, that big a difference. But the thing is, we are talking a volume of 524 square micro, uh, uh, cubic micrometers, while the particle on the right side has a volume of almost 4,200 cubic micrometers. And that difference is much bigger, and that's actually uh, what it's worth because that's the weight, the volume means the weight and uh, for example gold is of course um, measured by weight or, or the price by weight and this is just the factor two. So as the volume always goes with a power of three, you can imagine if we just triple the diameter we will multiply the volume by 27. And if we look at the, the charting or at the measuring size of such an instrument, we are not talking about diameters um, tripling the size. We are talking about 100 times the size which we can measure. So you can imagine what that means for the volume and the actual weight. So this just gives you an idea of how important it can be to just know the difference between only 10 and 29 uh, micrometers or also between 10 and 12. So uh, it's really something that can save you a lot of money and really increase your efficiency during your process. We will take another step back actually now um, because how do we measure such small sizes? We talk about 10 micrometers, 20 micrometers. To give you a comparison, my hair is probably 50 micrometers thick. 
So 10 micrometers is like a fifth of my hair, which is basically almost nothing. You cannot, there's no real way to measure that physically, yeah? So how do we do that? Well, the simple answer is fridge. But of course, that is not a very satisfying answer. You want to know more details. And um, before I do that, as I said, you measure it with Fritsch. Let me introduce Fritsch to you first, so you know who we are, what we do, uh, where we came from, um, which is actually quite interesting, because the topic of this speak, uh, speech with the particle sizing is not our main business. It's a business that we started because it was just very natural from our base business to do that. Why is that? Okay, here you see a map of Germany and there you see the location of Fritsch in the southwest. Um, you introduced me with studying in Paderborn, so that is not on here, but that would be somewhere there. That's where my university is, where I studied, also where I'm from. Uh, as at 2019, I moved down there to Fritsch. And you see the city where we're located, it's called Ida Oberstein, you see it here from an aerial view. It's not a big city, it has only around 30,000 inhabitants, but it is a little bit of a special city in Germany. And the reason is, actually it fits very well to the topic I chose at the beginning, mining. You might maybe know that Germany is very, very poor regarding resources. Okay, uh, we have almost nothing. I mentioned coal, so here there's an area that's why there are so many cities also where they found coal in the earth. But apart from that, re we really don't have anything. We have no oil, we have no minerals, no gems, we have almost nothing in our earth. One exemption, and that's this city. So about 120, 150 years ago, they discovered some mineral mines, gemstone mines, in this region. And through that, of course, a gemstone industry developed here. These mines were also not very rich, so about 100 years ago they were already empty and finished, but the business was there, the people working in the gemstone and jewelry industry were there, so what they did, they moved to other countries to get their raw material, especially to Brazil, which is very, very, very rich in resources, and got their resource material from there and continued the business of gem and jewelry in Ida Oberstein. Um, you see milling and sizing more than 100 years. So what happened in about 1919, two brothers by the name of Max and Alfred Fritsch, they used this industry not for gems and jewelry, but what they did is they had agate manufactured in a way to produce a mortar grinder for pharmacies. You know, in pharmacies, uh, of course, you, you, the drugs you use, you need them as a fine powder in order to really um, do what they do in the body. If you just take a big chunk, it will probably just go through. You need it to be taken in by the body, so you need very fine particles. So, so they produced, uh, out of agate, mortar grinders where you just can grind particles or, or drugs manually. That was the beginning of the business. And very naturally, a technology evolved and the business was, of course, grinding particles, making things smaller. So in the 1950s, they automated that. And at the end or mid-1950s, they invented the first planetary ball mill, where basically you have a container with your material, you have a couple of um, balls of a hard material inside, and then you rotate that. So what happens is the balls in that container hit the material against the walls multiple times and that way crush this material. So this is still, till this day, our most successful product actually, the planetary ball mills. To our luck also, there is only two manufacturers in the world for these mills. Now it's maybe three as a Chinese company uh, was coming up, but there's really just two companies, one located here, one located here. Forgot the name of the other company, unfortunately. Um, but it's, of course, a very good thing for us um, that there is nobody else, really, uh, who does this except for these two. So I give you also a quick look at the company itself. That's where where we are and how it looks like. So as you can see, we have two buildings down here, which are uh, based from the 70s, where we have all the um, application lab sales development. 
uh, department. And then in 2014, we actually built a completely new uh, manufacturing hall up here, or basically two, um, to make some space. Yeah, we're growing. Also, this is not really up to date, as you see here where the trees are. Um, we actually opened a new building there, which we call the Robert Fritsch Tower, in uh, May. So we should update this slide maybe. Anyhow, I added a picture of the new building. So this is the new building which was opened this May. We will also make a roof terrace here to um, yeah, basically give our guests a good view uh, for lunch and so on. But that's what it looks like right now. I talked about our product portfolio a little bit and how it was developed, how it came to life. Of course, uh, a lot of years have passed since the first automatic mill and our portfolio now consists of about 20 mills where you see um, yeah, some overview here. It's of course not only planetary ball mills, it might be cutting mills, knife mills, so there are different varieties of these mills. How did we get to particle sizing then? So especially with the invention of the planetary ball mill, it was all of a sudden possible to grind particles smaller and smaller. And at some point, we were, of course, doing marketing with, we can grind particles to the nano range, which, of course, was true. But how are you going to prove that? I mean, you can claim almost anything. You need to prove it as well. And that, the natural next step was to add a particle sizer into the portfolio. This was not possible uh, in the 1950s, 1960s, or 1970s. The technology was there theoretically. So um, this thing right here, which we also have here, and which we talk about today, is a so-called laser particle sizer. And it was computer power. No human would be able to do the calculations uh, to actually get the particle size. This was only possible in the 1980s when computers were capable enough to calculate these algorithms which are necessary in order to actually get a result from the physical process to um, yeah, your, your result on, on a piece of paper. Um, it's not the only one, so uh, within the last decade we also added this instrument which is dynamic image analysis. If you have any questions about that, we have time, we can talk about that as well. But for this presentation I will now stick to this one which we also have here in, in, um, yeah, in the room. So some of the pictures and some of the videos you'll see here, uh, you don't even need to pay too close attention because later on we will see it in real life. But again, a step back before I talk about the instrument itself, let us talk again about particle size. So what is the diameter of a particle? If I ask you here for this um, laser pointer, what's the size of the laser pointer? If I said it's 10 centimeters, you could hardly argue, could you? If I said it's one centimeter, would you argue? That's the thing. What is the size of this? I mean, we could actually argue about it. So a simple thing is just measuring size of something can become very complicated because there are different definitions of size. Yeah? As you see here on the left side, this particle has a very odd shape. On the second slide, we saw a sphere. So for a sphere, it's very, very simple because there's basically, um, in all three dimensions, it has the same diameter. So there you just give the diameter that's the size, hard to argue with that. But that kind of a particle, and uh, in a lot of samples and in a lot of applications, you don't deal with spheres. You deal with things like that. So what is the size of this? First of all, you need to define this. Because of course, I could go in here and look at this particle, and I look at the minimum Fourier, and I say, well, oh, this particle is 50 microns. Then I send it to uh, the lab next door, and he measures this, but he measures the maximum Fourier. And he says, no, the size of the particle is 80 microns. Actually, we are both right, but still, we are not on the same page. So first of all, you need to define size itself before you actually make a real measurement or before you actually publish anything. Um, in our case, as we will see in a, in a minute, we don't measure anything directly. The reason is we can't. When we talk about 
10 micrometers, one micrometer, we have no opportunity to do a direct measurement. This, we can do a direct measurement. You just give me a meter, I put the meter on here and uh, we'll see the size of it, maybe 10 centimeters. We can measure that directly. If I pull out one of my hairs and I put it on the table, can you measure that directly? How big it is, how, how thick it is? Again, size, how big? Yeah, the length maybe you can measure, but the thickness, I don't think so, that you can make a direct measurement of the thickness. It's almost impossible because it's too small. So, if we talk about laser particle sizing and we talk about size, we also have oddly shaped particles here. But what we talk about is something like the equal cross-sectional area. So, in two dimensions, speaking of two dimensions here with this particle, we just take a circle that has the same area as our particle and then we just take the diameter of that circle okay in order to get a size of this particle that is more or less doing an average of it and we also do that on on other occasions which we you will see so measurement of the particle diameter that's what we need to do and I already mentioned it would be very nice to just use a caliper but we can't because uh, the things we talk about are just way too small you can barely see them with your eyes so what we have to do in such a case is we need to measure a physical property of our sample. <coughs> and then we use any appropriate theory, and there are two in our case, and with that theory we put in the physical property and we calculate our diameter from it. This is also in, in the practical world when using this instrument very, very important to always keep in mind that we do not make a direct measurement. We always make an indirect measurement. And so there is lots of things that can happen in between. Yeah? So the, the measurement of the physical property is always the same. But at the end, what we get, there's also always something in between. There's always the computer, basically, in between that does the work for us. And that's very, very important to keep in mind when talking about this whole process. Speaking of which, what is the process? What is the physical property we are measuring? In our case, it's diffraction. We use a laser in our instrument, and this laser goes through these maybe 50 centimeter uh, lengths inside the instrument. And on the other side, we have an, a semiconductor detector array. So if we just shoot our laser beam on the array, what we expect would be, of course, um, some intensity directly on the spot where the laser hits, and everything else should be dark. Now, we use the physical principle of scattering or diffraction here on our particles to get some kind of property, some uh, specific property information or particles. And that is, we bring a stream of particles into our laser light, so that's also important, that's why it's called static light scattering. Yes, the particles are moving, they are not static, they are moving, they are actually dynamic, but because we have a, a dynamic stream of particles, or a, a stream which basically shows the same picture all the time. It's a dispersion of particles which is running through our laser um, and that's why we call it static light scattering because it has the same effect as you, if you put, for example, a grid into the, the ray of light and uh, on the other side. You will now measure different intensities than in the case without sample. As you can see here, now we will get maxima and minima. So we will basically have a diffraction pattern which stems from the fact that we will get constructive and destructive interference from our diffraction process in our cell. And the nice thing about this is that now we, can, we have a direct relation between the pattern that we measure with our detector array and the size of the particles we put into our measuring cell which we want to find the size of. Basically, that means for small particles, we get big scattering angles, so 
uh, here on two-dimensional base, we get widely spaced scattering rings. And if we enter large particles into our machine, we will get very small scattering angles, which in that case would mean very narrow rings. It's also important to understand that we, of course, do not measure this in this two-dimensional uh, array. We have a detector array in there, of course, just from the middle to one side. And that way, we basically measure the distance between the rings. And also, rings refer to spherical samples or to spherical particles. Yeah? If we would measure a particle as we've seen, an oddly shaped one, which is not a sphere, we, of course, don't get a beautiful ring like this. We will also get an oddly shaped interference pattern. Uh, but at the end of the day, since we just measure here in one line, and of course the orientation of the particles, and we're talking of millions of particles, is always different going through the laser. At the end of the day, we get an average of that. Yeah? Nonetheless, the easiest way would be a ring, because there we have the same distance uh, to the middle in all dimensions, so it doesn't matter if we put our array here or here. Um, so this is actually an ideal case uh, as we so often use it in, in science. So the use of light scattering for particle measurement, how does it look, how does the setup look? I mean, this was just a theoretical way. We use a laser, we use a particle, and we have a detector, and then we get signals, and with that we calculate something. That's basically it. So it doesn't become, from the hardware setup, that much more complicated. Because in every particle or laser particle sizer in the world, what you'll find is a laser. You'll find, on the other side, a detector array. And then you just need a measurement cell where you can, no matter if it's dry or wet, but in any way, you must transport your particles, your samples, through that cell to transport it through the laser beam in order to get your diffraction par pattern out at the other end. So the theoretical setup is rather simple. That's all you need. The laser beam, an optical system, of course, a sample, and a detector. In reality, of course, we sophisticate things a little bit, and it's not always that simple because there are, of course, different optical setups possible, and you look to have the version which works best, because you also don't want to have a setup which goes from that wall to that wall. That will be very difficult. You want to have the whole thing as small as possible, uh, which can be challenging, because of course, the wider you make the space between the laser and the detector, the better you'll be able to have a resolution on the detector, which is quite logic. But as I explained, you have to make some kind of compromise there. And then, of course, you have to think and uh, find solutions where you can get the same results, very good results, high resoluting on a very small space. This is an overview of the different versions we had since 1985. So I just mentioned in, in, in the 80s it actually became possible to build these kind of machines. And the very first one is this orange one here. The picture doesn't really um, show it in, in, in the dimensions, but I've seen it uh, in our factory in old ones, so really the dimensions were maybe from that end of the table up to here. So at that time, it was still a lot bigger because uh, the optical setups and the, the innovations which, ha which have happened in between were not there yet. And then over time, as you can see, it got smaller and smaller. And now this is our current version, which we call the NLZ22 Next. It was introduced into the market in 2020, so two years ago. And we're particularly proud of this one as we have some really, really nice inventions which are all patented, uh, which we put into this instrument, basically leading to a very, very good value for money ratio. As there are some things we just left out which we don't need anymore, but uh, we don't need them because we made up our mind and came to more efficient solutions. And if you have questions about that later on, I'll be very, very happy to, of course, answer them. So how does the instrument look on the inside? Very similar to the basic setup I was just showing you. Um, 
we have two versions also of the instrument because it might be that you just have samples which have a size range of 200 to 400 micrometers. And if that's your size range, you basically don't need the very sophisticated part of the nano ranges. So for customers uh, like that, we have built a basic version, which we call the next micro. And the measuring range here is 500 nanometers to 1.5 millimeters. Uh, it basically looks like this on the inside. Here we have the detector array. 51 elements. We have our laser there, which is a green semiconductor laser of 532 nanometers. And then we have the measuring cell where we enter the sample in the middle. We also monitor the reflection here to get an idea uh, of the um, laser power, because of course, if you measure that here, you always have something in between. So it's much more, much better to use the reflection of the laser. Still a rather simple setup. And you might wonder why on such a short space, why did we, were we able to get from here to here and shorten that space and still be able to detect um, the larger particles? Because of course, if you remember, large particles means small angles. Yeah? Um, so small angles would be somewhere here. And we were able to, to keep that space smaller and smaller as we just improved on the Semiconductor. We were searching a long time for a manufacturer that can give us a detector element with, with, which is extremely, extremely thin, and we found one in Germany. So that's the way we are able to uh, still work with the same resolution, although we take a lot of less bench space. And then the second version it would be the next nano. You can see here the measuring range is much improved. And basically, this is done because we don't just have the main detector here with the 51 elements, but we add five sideways or large angle detectors um, and also four backscattering detectors. So these come into play. The smaller the particles get, the bigger the angles become. And at some point, you will not only have scattering in large angles, you will also get backscattering, which will be very, very important in order, or for your algorithm, in order to calculate your particle size. So that would be the setup of the next nano. To this point, we only talked about the measuring. So we only talked about the laser, we have a cell, we have a detector, and so on. And a lot of people focus on this very much. They talk about, oh, how many detector elements you have and how many lasers and what's the, the uh, wavelength of the laser and so on and so on. If you ask me, all those things are not really important because no matter if you have 532 or 650, if you have 51 elements or 60, at the end of the day, it's just physics happening in there, yeah? Uh, and physics don't lie. So the scattering which takes place, it's just happening by a natural law. You can't influence that. The only influence we have is what do you show it? Yeah? And that is one of the most neglected, although most important parts in particle sizing. What I mean by this is our sample preparation. Let me give you an example. So this is a particle which we introduce into our dispersion unit and which flows through our laser beam and is measured. So the result, of course, will give us an average. I mean, this is not perfectly round, but an average of the diameters. Let's call it whatever, 50 microns. And that will be our result. Now, it might be that you know, because you produced the sample, and you know that it is definitely around one or two microns. Yeah. And then you measure it, and your result is 50 microns. So the first assumption always is, well, something's wrong with the machine. But as I said, the machine doesn't lie. It just does physics. But the issue was, you showed the machine, as you can already see, not the single particles, but they did agglomerate by any kind of force, uh, may it be electrostatic force or something else. They agglomerated to a bigger particle. So what you need to do in this case is, you need to enter some kind of energy for a dispersion process to break these agglomerates apart. 
and you need to be able to present your laser and your measuring unit with this kind of a dispersion where you just have the single particles and now your result will be as expected the one or two micrometers so it is not the laser itself it is not the measuring unit where the magic happens the most magic really happens in the preparation in the so-called dispersion process um, in this case the instrument I brought here we're always talking about wet dispersion so mo no matter what sample you have if it's a dry powder if it's an emulsion or whatever it is we always create a dispersion first we disperse our particles in a liquid and then measure it and this dispersion process is critical it's the most critical thing in the entire process because this was maybe a, a drastic example of the 50 and 1 micron but it is something that happens every single day that you measure something while your actual particles are way smaller and it is not an issue of the measurement um, device it's an issue of your sample preparation it's an issue of what you show the measurement device and that is one very very important step to understand because we have scientists here so you might not be surprised when I tell you there is no perfect measurement in the world it does not exist you will with every measurement you make no matter what it is you will always have an error always I mean uh, we could go as deep uh, as Heisenberg but you know that there's always an error in every single measurement and how does the total error uh, how is the total error put together so the total error always is um, the sum of the measurement error and the preparation error of course the measurement error that's our duty that's on our part with the instrument um, that's not your part but we share this whole thing because of course the preparation error that is something you can minimize that is on your part that is something you have to take care of to keep it as small as possible and also in order to keep your general measurement error as small as possible and that's very important to understand in this case to get an idea about the different size ranges and the effect of um, the different errors uh, I think this chart is quite helpful so as you can see the instrument error um, with small sizes big sizes um, gets a little bit bigger but if we compare the the addition of these three you see that it's not the biggest one the instrument error so especially when we walk uh, when we when we go into big particle sizes the sampling becomes very very important uh, an example is we have a cement factory and they do not produce just a single spoon of cement they produce truckloads of cement every single day so you have a truck with cement and that's moving that's driving so if you take a spatula and that's all we need for one measurement from the very top of that truckload you might get a different result than if you take that spatula from the very bottom it might not be perfectly homogeneous that sample so the bigger the particle size the more important the sampling becomes on the other hand if we talk about smaller particles here the critical factor is really the dispersion and that's of course logic because the smaller your particle the much bigger the effect of any electrostatic forces or the van der Waals forces so these really come into play the smaller your particles become and that's also something you can influence yeah? you can definitely influence the dispersion and there are so many ways to influence a dispersion uh, later on when we get to the practical part I have one example prepared for you which yeah I'll see maybe we repeat it so that everybody can really see it up close but uh, this is I think a very very good example how you are able to influence the dispersion and minimize this which can become as you compare it to the others a huge error yeah, the dispersion is very very critical and I know I repeat myself but I will repeat it again and again and again because it is just the most important thing when you use a laser particle sizer and because of that our emphasis with this new instrument was not only the measuring unit I already showed you what we did there and uh, that we actually keep kept it quite simple in that regard which is a good thing our main emphasis was on our wet dispersion unit because as we see here the wet dispersion unit 
is responsible for the biggest possible error in your entire measurement. And with the wet dispersion unit, which we created, we not only built something that is very efficient, but also something um, that is actually a revolution on the market. And the reason is the following. Here you see the typical schematic setup of a wet dispersion unit for a laser particle sizer. So basically, every instrument must have something similar. Of course, here we, for example, use a centrifugal pump. There can be other kinds of pumps used, but it doesn't matter. You need a pump. You need to be able to transport your dispersion through your cell. So the critical thing is, as you see here, we have a closed circuit. So we pump our dispersion with our particles here through the measuring cell back into our dispersion unit, and we have a closed cycle. So this way we can measure. We keep pumping our dispersion through the cell so the laser can go through here and the light can be detected on the other end. So we get a result. Um, we actually get some signals and can calculate the result out of that. But of course, we might want to change the dispersion, measure the next sample. What, so what needs to happen here is we need to clean our dispersion unit. And in all the units in the world, this works with the so-called 4-2 way valve. What happens is the valve turns, and now we have an open circuit. So we can basically flush our old dispersion out of the unit, and we bring fresh water in in order to have a new clean water for the next sample to be measured. And once this is done, the valve closes again back to the closed circuit. Now, you know we are talking about nanoparticles here, micrometer particles, and you can imagine in a dispersion with such small particles, it is anything but ideal to have moving parts in here. Yeah? This needs to be sealed extremely well. You don't want to get any particles here somewhere in the moving areas because then this thing will break pretty soon. And if it does, you can basically replace the entire unit because this is the heart and soul. This is the most expensive part of such a wet dispersion unit. And uh, there is no real sense in just exchanging this for to wave off. Uh, so what we did when we developed our new unit, we thought about a way how can we eliminate this critical part from this process. And we found actually a really simple solution, but nobody in the world in the last 100 years had this idea seemingly. So we were able to patent it. And when you see it, it is actually really simple. So our wet dispersion unit looks like this. Again, we have the pump. We pump our material, our dispersion, with our particles here through the measurement cell. Goes this way, goes back into our dispersion bath. And we have our closed cycle. So this way we can measure. And once the measurement is done, we want to flush the unit, get fresh water or fresh liquid in in order to be ready for the next measurement. How do we do that in our case? We build something that we call the reflux. And there's no more valve there. All that happens is we move that thing up into the drain. We bring fresh water in from here. And once we are done with the cleaning process, we just move this reflux back down. No more valve involved. Very, very, very simple, but very, very, very efficient as well. So this, I think, from the entire instrument, even if we have uh, lasers in the high technology detectors and so on and so on, if you ask me, this is the best invention uh, which is a part of this instrument, although it's actually so incredibly simple. But maybe the best inventions are sometimes the ones that are so incredibly simple. So not only, of course, did we uh, change the entire schematic setup of this thing, we are able to do some other things which are quite important for a good dispersion. Um, here you'll see the, the, uh, how this reflux works in real life, although later on you can actually see it live. So there you have this rod, uh, which is able to move up and down um, in order to change between cleaning process and measuring process. But we also built in uh, the temperature measurement, so we are able to monitor the temperature of our dispersion. 
And as you saw in this chart how critical the dispersion itself is, especially for the measurement error, you can imagine that a change of temperature um, by maybe 5 to 10 degrees, depending on how stable or um, how prone to change your dispersion is, can actually influence your dispersion. And so that is something you need to know. Yeah? If you measure a material in the morning and then you measure the same in the evening and all of a sudden you find a difference, this is definitely something you can then exclude. If you realize, oh, the first measurement was done at 17 degrees dispersion temperature and the second one at 30 degrees, uh, this might be a hint that this change in temperature has influenced your dispersion. And when it influences your dispersion, it influences your measurement, it influences your result, although you measure the exact same particles. And of course, something that can also be very critical um, apart from the temperature is the pH value. The pH value, of course, can do the same thing to your dispersion and change some specific um, parameters in your dispersion and thus change your results, change your measurement. So this is an optional thing also we offer to have a pH meter integrated into the wet dispersion in order to monitor that as well. And speaking of some other things which of course you are responsible for when um, making the dispersion for a measurement. Adding the sample is also very critical. So how much sample do we add into the machine? It's not that you can enter any amount. You have to have really uh, a good compromise there. And the simple reason is, let's start from the bottom here maybe, if you enter too little sample, yeah, very, very little, very few particles, you will probably not get a very good and reliable result. The reason is, what we do, of course, is before we make any measurement, before we um, enter the sample into our unit, we make a background measurement. So we basically, in case we're measuring in water, we just measure the detector signals when the laser beam is going through the pure water. Because, of course, you'll always have noise. You'll always have some intensity somewhere. And what we want to do is we want to be able to deduct this background measurement from our actual measurement of our particles. Now, if we add too few particles, what will happen is the signal-to-noise ratio will be very bad. So the, the result is then very, very prone to um, peaks where maybe there's actually no particles because um, the difference between the background measurement and the actual measurement is so small. Because you will never ever be able to make the exact same background measurement twice. This will be impossible. This will be like winning the lottery. So between every background measurement, of course, the, the number of counts on the detector elements will always be a little different. Yeah? So that's why we need enough sample to have a good noise, uh, um, signal to noise ratio. On the other hand, if we add too much sample, we will have probably a really, really good signal to noise ratio. But there's something else that's going to happen, and that is going to actually influence the quality of our measurement. Uh, and that is multiple scattering. So imagine the laser beam comes into the dispersion, gets scattered on one layer of particles, goes, but it continues. The scattered ray of light continues through the dispersion and gets scattered again, and then goes out and goes on your detector element. It actually got scattered twice, which would be a wrong signal. So uh, if you add too much sample, the multiple <laughs> scattering will become uh, an issue. And that's why there is, I will show you later in real life where, where this area ranges from, but there's a certain area where you have the best compromise of these two extremes, where you have still a good signal to noise ratio, but the multiple scattering, I mean, it will always happen at some point. Yeah, you will, of course, not be able to make a measurement and only have single, single scattered uh, light beams. That's impossible as well. But uh, the range where this is good and still the multiple scattering is not too critical in order to get a reliable result. And speaking of the amount of sample you add, in some cases, the availability of the sample is also very limited. I had one customer sending me samples which were so scarce in material uh, that it was really, really difficult 
to find a process for the measurement because of course there's very simple samples you just throw them in you get always the same results super I like I love these samples but there are also samples where especially if you don't know them you have to test first how do they disperse you have to work on the process you have to find the right process to measure that sample and this sample in particular it was platinum paste so uh, for the electronics industry as you can imagine platinum highly expensive so this paste was highly expensive so he did not want to send me uh, a half a kg of his paste he sent me really really small amounts and um, so the less I add for every measurement the better it is because the more measurements I can make and for that purpose we actually also introduced in our wet dispersion unit uh, a flexible filling height so the maximum is around 500 milliliters and the minimum is around 150 millimeters so you can actually adapt the volume of the wet dispersion unit to the amount of sample you have yeah uh, the next thing we talked about the dispersion process now it could also happen that you for example want to measure an emulsion a stable emulsion in such a case you don't need any deagglomeration because if it's a stable emulsion it is oil droplets and water for example uh, it will not change you don't need to introduce any energy to disperse this sample better because it's already a perfect dispersion and for that reason we made the ultrasonic box in the instru instrument uh, an add-on so here you see it can work without ultrasonic box if you have samples which need ultrasonic treatment for deagglomeration you can just add the ultrasonic box uh, additionally or later on maybe you, you start with emulsions and then at some later stage you realize actually we uh, now have samples where agglomeration is a critical factor so you can then afterwards after two years or whatever still order the ultrasonic box integrated into the system and then go with that so flexibility uh, was really a key in the development of this instrument in order to give yeah, every customer more or less the opportunity to just, just pay for what he what he really needs so a lot of theoretical talk and in order to shift um, to the more practical part let's look at some some results of, of particles um, so here you have some examples of carbon powder of some uh, battery materials and you see it, it, it is ranged in a slightly different particle size areas and also what you can see if you look really closely you see there is actually multiple colors in every curve here you see it I think quite well here you see it so of course very very important when making uh, measurements is to make multiple consecutive measurements because we want to see is our dispersion actually stable do we always get the same result so the standard usually is you make three consecutive measurements and see uh, does it change in any way so with these three you see there's a slight difference maybe at the peak also here and there is a very slight difference um, of the three curves in the very fine range anyhow with all of these three results I can live with them very easily there are samples uh, actually we brought some soil from outside uh, because soil is a very good example sometimes if you pick up some some dirt from the ground and you think oh there's a stone but then when you really crush it really hard on a hard surface you realize no it's actually breaking apart it's not a stone it's actually clay which is so agglomerated so hard that that you, you don't realize it's actually very small particles and clay is like two micrometers so it's very very small if you would measure such a sample what can happen to you over uh, measuring three different uh, or making three different measurements is that the first measurement you actually get your peak here somewhere between 100 and 1000 microns second one because it's already breaking apart by the introduction of the ultrasonic power you'll get a peak somewhere here below the 100 microns and the third one you're already in the region of 10 microns so it would be a very instable dispersion instable measurement what you would have to do in such a case or what I would recommend you to do is take your soil take your clay disperse it in water maybe even add some chemical some surfactant to help it disperse and then put that in an external ultrasonic for five ten minutes something to really get a 
prepared dispersion, and that's actually what most of the geographical uh, or geological institutes who have this instrument and measure soil, what they do, and then take this ready-made dispersion and introduce that into the instrument. So that is just one example where, again, I can only repeat myself, preparation is the most, most important step in the entire process of measuring samples with a laser particle sizer. Of course, you will not only get um, this kind of distribution, the, the software of the instrument is very flexible. So um, you, of course, get your distribution chart, you get a cumulative sum curve, but you can flexibly uh, and individually uh, enter certain tables either for the D values. So what that means is, for example, here you see 10% and we see 10% uh, of our material are smaller than 460 nanometers. You can also flip that and start with a size table and enter individual sizes, which then tell you, for example, here, 99.8% uh, of your sample material are below 10 micrometers. So uh, this is all very, very flexible and individually adaptable. To summarize, uh, the machine we will be using, um, I think this afternoon after lunch, uh, the measuring range you can use is 10 nanometers to 3.8 millimeters. Although I have to say, um, we can detect 20 nanometer particles, yes? But here uh, we are in a, a physics department, so it might be that you really have particles of 20, 30 nanometers where you need an exact measurement. If that is the case, I would actually not recommend you a laser particle sizer, not static light scattering. Because below 100 nanometers, we get signals, we can determine sizes, but it's becoming very inexact for the simple fact that we are measuring with a laser of 530 nanometers, visible light, and if we talk about 10 nanometer, 20 nanometer particles, it's just much, much smaller than our incoming wavelength. So as of, yeah, law of nature, your measurement will not be very exact. You can detect something, but if you really need exact results in the 30, 40 nanometer range, I would definitely recommend you a different technique. On the other hand, if you look at that size range, you will get no other instrument or no other technique which can give you results in such an incredible, incredibly big range. This is actually really the only technique which covers such a huge range of particle sizes. Um, yeah, this I don't even need to mention. You will see it, uh, the width and the, the compact design. Talked a little bit about the flexible configuration so you can adapt actually the parts you buy to your individual needs. And um, a big advantage of the dispersion I mentioned and also the, the optical design is that we are not only robust but we are very fast. So this instrument, I mean, I know the previous one still which we seized in 2020 when this one came into the market, our old instrument, was by far not as fast as this one. This is really a high-speed uh, model, so to speak. And the whole in inventions which I presented and which I showed you really end up in a very, very good uh, price-performance ratio um, for this model. So there's a lot of other things I could talk about. I mean, I just spoke about wet dispersion. There's, of course, also the opportunity of dry dispersion. And there are so many other things we could touch on when speaking about uh, laser particle sizing. However, um, we have limited time today. So I would like to close my presentation here and now, of course, leave the field for you. Uh, to have questions, I have more slides from other presentations, so if any question you ask might fit there, I'm of course able to, to also give you um, some other slides where I explain uh, any relations or try to answer any questions you might have. But for this one, I again thank you all for your attention and hit me with your questions, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Baluga, for your greatly presentation. Now I will open the Q&A session. To all participants, you can ask your question by raising your hand and or type your question in the chat box for those of you who are joining this seminar online. Also, you can deliver your question both in English or in Bahasa Indonesia. So please, everyone, to take advantage of this great opportunity by asking your question to our presenter. 
So, any question? Okay, okay. Okay, thank you very much for your nice presentations. What? I want to ask about uh, the liquid samples. Uh, you mentioned that uh, we need enough sample for the characterization, but you are not mentioned how much, uh, I think uh, how, how many uh, microliter or milliliter that we need to uh, use to the, uh, to, for the characterization, for the mm -hmm. liquid. And then for the powder, uh, I think I don't know. You are not mentioned about the the mass. I mean, how much that uh, we should prepare uh, for the dry uh, sample. Uh, and another question is, uh, how about the I'm uh, purifications of the samples? Uh, uh, I mean that's uh, should we use a pure uh, sample for the liquid or we just uh, use any sample that uh, we use? I, I mean, uh, how about the buffer or the solution that we use in here? Uh, two you. very good questions. So uh, I'll start with the first one maybe. Uh, there is a reason why I did not present you any amount of sample that needs to be added. Because that is a question I cannot answer you in general. It depends on the sample. This is, by the way, probably to 80% of the questions, the answer, it depends on the sample. <laughs> but of course, I can give you an idea why and how. Um, this is also a good opportunity to shift um, to a slide I know I have somewhere, which gives you a good idea. Um, so. Basically, you could, you could simplify, uh, just for a, a thought experiment, you could simplify the whole process of the diffraction. Yeah? So let's say, uh, it's, it's a big simplification, but it, it kind of explains the, the issue why there is no way to, to, give, you a, to give you a general answer. Um, you could imagine that every particle we introduce into the measuring cell will diffract uh, one beam of light. So, very big simplification as I said, but let's just assume. Um, now, if you add one gram of one micrometer particles compared to one gram of one millimeter particles, the number of particles here, although it's the same amount, will be drastically different. In one case, you'll maybe have 10 million, and the other, you'll maybe have 10. So in the one case, you get 10 million, um, uh, result, uh, 10 million um, hits on your detector, and the other you only get 10. So speaking again about signal-to-noise ratio, the 10 million will definitely be en enough. The 10 will by far not be enough, although you twice added one gram. So the general answer is the smaller your particle size, the less sample you enter, the bigger your particle size, the more sample you enter. And that's the slide I was looking for here because that gives you a little bit of an idea. Uh, where's my pointer? So here you see um, on the x-axis the particle size and on the y-axis the sample volume added. And also you have three curves. So um, also this gives me the opportunity to explain you another very critical thing. Uh, when we talk about adding the sample, you see here uh, uh, something called beam obscuration. 20%, 10%, 5%. What is the beam obscuration? The beam obscuration is the percentage of the incoming original laser light intensity which is scattered by your particles. So it is basically showing you how much, how much sample you added. And talking about noise to uh, no, signal to noise ratio and also multiple scattering the the really the range you're looking for is somewhere here between 10 to 20 percent so usually that's the best compromise between these two uh, factors or disadvantages the the bad signal to noise ratio and the multiple scattering so 10 to 20 percent is what you're looking for and if we check the chart so here uh, we talk about aluminium dioxide with the d50 uh, of 17 micrometers, and as you can see here, 
For example, if we add 89 milligrams, we'll get a beam obscuration of 4%. So talking about 10 to 20, the ideal amount, if you look here at these numbers, I'd say the ideal amount of this sample would probably be something like 250 milligrams to add. So that is definitely something you need to find out. So also for me, I get a new sample and I maybe get an idea more or less where the particle size is ex expected to be. The first time I add the sample into the machine, of course you best go slow because you can always add more. Extracting it back is very difficult. So uh, you always go very slow, but sometimes you get an emulsion and it's so fine, it's like uh, whatever, 200, 300 nanometers, and you just add one drop and it's already too much. Um, so then you need to be very careful, but at the end of the day, uh, you need to check it for each sample. This just gives you an idea. So if you know, okay, I have sand, which is maybe 800 microns, one millimeter, you can add a lot because it's very big. So as you can see, the sam needed sample volume um, will be quite a lot. Uh, the second question again was? Uh, the powder. The powder... Uh Dry sample for the, for, for the dry sample. Ah, yes, exactly. Yeah, your question was about, uh, of course, if we have a, a ready-made dispersion on emulsion, which is liquid already, uh, but you also might have a dry powder. And it's also a very good question. So also the dry powders, you would preferably measure in a wet dispersion. And I really like the question because if uh, that hadn't come up, I would definitely at the end explain that anyhow. Because it's a very typical question. We only have the wet dispersion module here. There is also a way of dry dispersion. The dry dispersion works in a way that you basically have a compressor with compressed air and you have a, have a nozzle. You, you feed the sample with a feeder into a funnel. Uh, down in the funnel with compressed air, you shoot it through the measuring cell through a so-called Venturi nozzle. And on the other end, you have a vacuum cleaner taking the sample back out. So that way you would shoot the sample dry or the powder dry through the cell. And it's a natural thought which you're having. This is coming very often. Customers think, hey, I have a dry powder, so I measure dry. But I'm always telling you, as long as there's the opportunity to measure wet, you measure wet. And the reason is the following. Let's assume you have a material, a powder, and you think, okay, I can measure the dry. It's a dry powder, so I measure dry. So you do so. And in your dry measurement, I mentioned the compressed air. This is more or less the equivalent to the ultrasonic power in the wet measurement. So the one parameter you can change for your measurement is the, the air pressure for between maybe zero and five bars. So let's say you measure your sample for weeks and weeks, and then all of a sudden you get one batch of your sample, and it comes in totally different from the result. So you always start by, hmm, maybe it's the dispersion. So you might want to increase the compressed air, the air pressure. And if you do that, your option is to go anywhere between zero and five bars, but it might be the case that it doesn't help you, that you cannot get a good result, maybe that batch has a higher amount of moisture, or whatever it is. Yeah, it has some, some property which is different from the previous batches, although the particle size is the same. So your only option in the dry measurement is the air pressure. If that does not help, you are out of options. There's nothing now you can do to get a good result for your sample. In the wet dispersion, it's absolutely different. So if you add that powder to your wet dispersion, same thing might happen. Maybe for this batch, you just get strange results because the dispersion is different. So uh, comparable to the air pressure, first you can go with the ultrasonic power to see if maybe you can uh, break a power agglomerates with that. Maybe it doesn't help you, okay? But with the wet dispersion, now you're by far not out of options. Maybe you realize your sample reacts with water, so you can change the liquid. You can go to isopropanol, you can go to hexane. You, there are hundreds of liquids you could use, first of all, uh, to improve your dispersion process. And even if we stay with water, there are even more options. So you can add any kind of chemical that will influence your dispersion, that would help your dispersion process in properly dispersing your material. And this, these are options which are so huge. Um, there are so many chemicals, so many surfactants you could try, 
and you could make a, a PhD thesis out of that. So you are never out of options, basically, in the wet measurement, while in the dry, it's just air pressure. Once that is done, there's nothing else you can do. And that's the simple reason why I always recommend wet. Of course, there are cases, there are materials and samples which just don't work wet. Classic example is uh, coffee powder. So no matter where you disperse coffee powder, we will always kind of change it. It was always partly dissolved, it will always swell, it will always change its, its um, properties. So for coffee, really, a dry measurement is necessary. Um, and there are other couple of uh, materials which you just have to measure dry. But to give you an idea of percentage-wise, I would say this really goes 80-20 or even 90-10 towards wet dispersion regarding that. So I hope that both answers the two questions. If not, let me know. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, maybe one question again about the, you mentioned that uh, if we have uh, aggregate solutions, uh, you can destroy and then so we can uh, measure the size. How about uh, we want to know uh, the solution, I, I mean if we have a protein uh, solutions and then so we want to know that it's aggregate or not. Mm -hmm. Can we use a PSA for no? So it depends. I mean, this is, again, uh, not easy to answer because it is um, very complex. It's a good point because maybe I shift back to that slide so everybody knows what we're talking about. Um, so there are different things that can happen. Uh, of course, as you mentioned, if you want to actually measure the uh, agglomerates or the aggregates like seen here. So what you mean is you have a material and it is an aggregate of, of other single particles, but you actually want to know this size and not the size of the single particle. So of course you have to make sure that you find a dispersion process where they stay as a whole, which is probably not so easy. And I can also expand on your question, because what could also be happening is that this is not an aggre uh, um, aggregate you want to measure, but this is the actual particle, but it's a very brittle, um, very sensitive material. And then you introduce the ultrasonic power, and what you do is you basically break the single particles into smaller particles. You basically do the, the job of milling in the laser sizer, which is, of course, not its purpose. So again, a very good question. And one, again, I cannot give a general answer because then it depends on your material. And you, of course, know your material best. So you have to find a way um, to make it work without breaking either the agglomerates or without breaking the particle itself down. And that is sometimes not that easy. So even if you leave away the ultrasonic, and you don't switch it on, you just let the whole dispersion circulate through the, uh, the instrument. Of course, we have a pump, which also introduces some kind of power. So maybe that is already enough to break the agglomerates which you want to measure apart. Yeah? Uh, maybe already the water is enough to, to disperse your agglomerates. And of course, there are cases where you will have no possibility to measure your agglomerates. If they are too instable, Dry measurement will not work. It will hit a wall in, in the Venturi nozzle. It will break apart. Maybe wet measurement, you put it in water, it immediately disperses. Then you might want to find another liquid. You take isopropanol, same story. So if you are trying all possible liquids and all possible things and still it always breaks apart, it's not stable enough, then you'll probably find no way to measure it. So, uh, but at the end of the day, it's a lot of research trying um, to get that dispersion which you want to at the end measure as a stable dispersion. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for the question. Is there anyone? Uh, thank you very much for this astonishing presentation. Um, and I do apologize for being late. Maybe you, you explain uh, in the first, but I would like to uh, ask about, um, in my laboratory, we produce uh, the material like nanoparticles with uh, powder and sometimes pellet form. And um, to determine the particle size, 
uh, we we frequently use uh, like scanning electron mic microscopy or transmission electron microscopy like that. Mm -hmm. And it is the same tools with uh, uh, both of uh, the tools that I mentioned before. Um, if it's same, maybe you can uh, share the, the advantages over these tools. And this is continue uh, the question from um, Ms. Ari about the solution. Uh, to, to measure uh, the particle, we, uh, we has, uh, it has to uh, be in the suspension. And is there uh, any special liquid to, to mix with the powder? Um, or uh, we can just use like distilled water? Um, Thank you. Both good questions. So this time I try not to forget the second one while I explain the first one. Um, you talk about uh, electron microscopy. And that is more or less, it's a direct method of measuring. So you could compare to an optical microscope. The only difference is on an optical microscope, you, you use the um, light wave, waves for the measurement. On the electron microscope, you use electrons, which basically, yeah, in the, um, uh, uh, it's also a wave, so to speak. That's why it works. So um, you measure directly. That's the first difference. And the second uh, more important difference is on the electron microscopy, it's slow and expensive. And you only get, and there's again sampling, you can only have a look at a very limited amount of samples. I mean, you could use, for example, whatever, let's say 90 milligrams of your sample. Yeah, and if you talk about, I don't know, two micrometer particles, so you can imagine the amount of particles you have in there. If you want to look at this entire uh, batch with the electron microscope, I'm pretty sure you'll get problems with the financial officer of the university here because this will be extremely expensive. Uh, so the advantage, of course, of the laser sizer here is we get a look at a much bigger batch. We still face the same problem also here, as I explained in the beginning, if we have uh, particles where you produce truckloads, again, we can only measure a spatula. That's the same problem that you would be having with the electron microscope, where you can just have a look at a few particles, although your, your batch might be, might be um, much bigger. But to go one step in the right direction, you could use this to actually monitor a bigger batch and get a better sampling and a better average of your system. So that would be basically um, answering your first question, and the second one about the liquid to add, uh, yes. So <laughs> uh, the thing you mentioned with the distilled water, of course, distilled water, uh, the cleaner your, your um, liquid, the better. So distilled water is never a bad thing. Although you, of course, uh, don't have to spend the money for expensive distilled water if you have good tap water. Uh, for example, in our lab back in the company, what we have is we have a filter uh, in front of the main water inlet in the laboratory, and then we just use the tap water. Uh, the only time that's an issue is when you change the cartridge of the filter. Then sometimes your water becomes a little foamy and uh, air bubbles in it, so, uh, but apart from that, Usually tap water is fine. Of course, if your tap water out of the tap is already brown, eh, you might rather want to switch to uh, distilled water. But in principle, the cleaner the better. It's something you just have to see and to try. And the, the um, liquids to add, I brought one. So um, actually, we have the instrument here in the same state as it is delivered with some accessories. And one of the accessories is a tensite called Dusazin, which is super extremely strong, uh, a surfactant. And of course, there are many, many different surfactants that you could use and many, many different things or, or uh, add-ons um, you could put into your dispersion. Uh, unfortunately, I'm a physicist and not a chemist, but the, if there are chemists, uh, they know much more about this stuff and how to influence a dispersion chemically. So yes, this is uh, basically unlimited. There are a few classic ones like the Dusazin, uh, sodium pyrophosphate you could use or citric acid. These are the, like the classics. But, um, I mean, you're at the source here of, of stuff in the university, so you could actually try, try things, try surfactants. Uh, it's limitless. But there's also a downside, of course, to using a surfactant. We'll get to that in the, in the later part of, of the um, 
practical overview because that's actually one thing I would really like to demonstrate you uh, how using this surfactant influences your dispersion in a good but sometimes also in a bad way. So just wait maybe until after lunch and uh, that will definitely be answered. You're welcome. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Uh, Mike. Uh, it's spell name. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Mike, uh, for uh, the good uh, presentation in advance. Uh, big thanks for sure. Uh, my question backs to uh, my previous uh, research during my uh, bachelor degree. Uh, I work with uh, organic materials uh, like uh, coconut cell charcoal or uh, rice husks, and as you know, uh, in Indonesia, especially for the east part of Indonesia, we work with organic materials. So uh, the specific organic materials have um, different shape uh, if we uh, analyze with uh, SEM or TEM. So uh, my question is, uh, is the instrument appropriate for uh, those specific materials, like organic materials that have uh, different types uh, distribution, or uh, uh, it's not homogen enough, uh, like, uh, um, like uh, crystals materials? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Also a very good question, also a common um, request we receive from customers. Uh, answer, as always, it depends. <laughs> um, so there are organics, uh, you mentioned coconut. So for example, uh, we actually have some coconut milk here as a sample to demonstrate later on. Um, organics, it's, if it's coconut milk, it can be animal milk, is actually a very nice sample because that kind of organic, uh, basically, let's, let's take the milk, it, it consists of protein and fat. So um, two things, which are particles. The fat, of course, it's, it's oil um, or spheres, or it's an emulsion. But still, you can measure that. And it's very stable. It's very easy. Now, of course, I have um, not so much knowledge about your materials, your samples, as you do. But the questions you need to ask yourself is, and you already said it's not stable. So you have to try. I mean, the measuring time is about five to 10 seconds, whatever you set for one measurement. So if you want to make, as I mentioned, uh, like three sets of measurement in order to see the reproducibility, um, you would have to have your sample stable in a dispersion for around 60 to 90 seconds altogether. Um, and even if it doesn't give you three stable results, what it then will give you is the information that just over 10 seconds, your particles are already changing. Uh, that might not be very satisfying, and I don't think that it, this information would be worth uh, the investment to this instrument. But for that specific reason, as my standard answer is always it depends, I know how unsatisfying that is. For that reason, we do have a um, free of charge service in our company. So if you have a material and you're interested in acquiring an instrument, you can send us the sample and we will measure it in our lab. Right now, the time frame for achieving results is, I mean, I think on the website, we still speak of two to four weeks. Currently, it's rather two to four months as we are so incredibly full with material, we just can't uh, um, yeah, get a hold of, of them all at the same time. Um, but that's, very important reason why we give this opportunity because as I mentioned in the beginning even for me every month I get a sample I've never heard of I cannot tell you anything about and I'll ju we just have to test it and a lot of times if a customer comes to me with a sample that I already know I can give him an answer works it works not uh, but especially with organic samples these are probably the most complex because as you mentioned they might change and I remember just had a customer from Switzerland sending us something which had to be frozen. Um, I'm on the road now for quite a while. I don't know if we have measured it yet, but that is a very good example to what you are mentioning. So these organic materials had to be frozen because once you, you put them in room temperature, they will change very quickly. Um, of course, if they change within five seconds, mm, probably it won't work. 
if the, the change takes a day, then yeah, surely you have a day for measuring. On the other hand, uh, you need to know how does your organic samples react to any kind of um, energy input. And I'm not only talking about ultrasonic, you can switch that off, but you need, as mentioned before, the pump to pump it through, which already puts some kind of mechanical force onto your sample. So these are all factors you need to calculate in, and um, it can work, it can also not work. Uh, it very much depends on your sample, and you, of course, know more about your sample than I do. Um, okay, uh, uh, tons of sorry. Uh, but um, could I confirm that uh, this instrument uh, will not appropriate enough in order to measure the specific size of the organic materials themselves? Because uh, as I got from your uh, crystal clear mention in advance that uh, it will measure the uh, average distribution of the particle size, uh, sizes themselves. Um, I didn't get the last part, sorry. I mean... Uh, because the organic materials have different size yes. and different shape yeah. of the materials themselves. So uh, commonly, we use uh, like uh, image uh, something uh, tools in order to specific uh, measure the uh, different shape, mm -hmm. to claim the different shape and to measure the different size of the materials themselves. Yes. So these instruments, uh, could I confirm that these instruments uh, will not appropriate enough in order to uh, measure uh, the specific uh, shape or the specific size of the materials themselves? Because it's just uh, measure the average distributions of the materials. Yes. Uh, yes. Basically, yes, because uh, that's what it does. It gives you a size distribution. And it's also very important to always remember it is really sp uh, specialized on size distribution. So many times we get the question, can it determine different uh, materials? No, it cannot. It can only give you of your sample the size distribution. Or can it tell me anything about concentration? Well, you could use all the parameters and you could start calculating, but that would be really an approximation. I would never sell a customer this instrument when what he's interested in is um, uh, the... Um, yeah the concentration of, of your, your sample in your um, solution or something. So it is really only about particle size distribution. That's very important. Also number, like counting. No, it's, it has nothing to do with counting at all. Yes, you can calculate backwards, get an idea of number of particles, but uh, this will be not very exact. So it is only limited really to the size distribution of your material, and that's all. And Again, same as your, your colleague next to you, if you do image, image uh, sizing, you probably get a better idea of individual particles because you do a direct measurement. So for these individual particles, you'll definitely have a better and more exact idea than in comparison to laser diffraction. On the other hand, again, you can only do that for a couple of particles, while here you get the average size distribution of a much bigger batch, of a much bigger number of particles in your dispersion. Okay, big thanks, Mr. Mike. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Paluga, for your interesting presentation. So I'm Diki from the Department of Physics. I have one question. So I'm interested on the advanced application of your laser-based equipment. So since I work in the photo-assisted processing, so I found that in some cases the laser exposure might affect the specific sample in a good way. Of course, in a good way, so we can uh, obtain all the uh, desired properties. So what I want to know here is, what is the specific energy that you use in your laser? Because it sometimes can affect the uh, samples. And mm -hmm. is it fixed on the specific value, or is it possible to tune the range of the laser energy? Mm -hmm. That's my question, thank you. Nice question. So let me start with the laser power. We use a very, very low laser power, actually. Uh, and the reason is what you already mentioned. We don't want uh, the laser to have any effect on the sample itself. Um, so the power is around one milliwatt, which we use. And actually, I had these discussions very rarely, though, but I had them with customers who say, why is the, your, your laser power is too low, and uh, this and that instrument, they use five mil milliwatts. It's like five times the power and so on. So uh, I asked back, yeah, what do you need it for? Why do you need five milliwatts of laser power? For what? 
you just need to do diffraction and you don't need a high power for that. The only thing that can happen with a high power is, as you mentioned, you can influence your, your material. So actually the low power, I see it as an advantage um, in that case. And can you tune the power? Yes, we can. Basically, we, by purpose, um, put it down to one milliwatt. Um, but at the same time, you can't. <laughs> so it's not an option in the software uh, because we don't want customers, you know, messing around in any of the deep things in, in the instrument and in the software because the only thing that will happen, and we know that by experience, is um, somebody does that, somebody else comes measures, things are not the same, they call us, and it takes us three days to find out why it is the case, and in the end, uh, it's clear somebody changed something in the settings. So, uh, yes, it's possible, and I can do it here if I want to, but we don't want the customer to do that for uh, a good reason. And um, I think that was all of the questions, right? But on the other hand, um, maybe your question brings me to something that I have not mentioned at all yet, but as you mentioned, the, the word tuning. It's maybe not the right word when we talk about science to use the word tuning, but anyhow, um, it is a good point. So I completely left this from this presentation because, of course, I cannot explain anything. But what you can change, and it's not about the, because you talked also about parameters for your, for your sample. And you can change the calculation that you can do. So, for example, um, in the very beginning I mentioned that we measure light intensities and we use an algorithm that calculates the light intensity into the particle size distribution. The basics for all of these calculations were basically laid by a guy called Mr. Fraunhofer about 200 years ago because he um, developed the Fraunhofer theory for light diffraction, or actually diffraction in general. And you see I also have a slide for that somewhere. So that is what we use um, in order to calculate with the algorithm the particle size. Maybe this slide works better. But about 100 years ago, another guy came up with another theory. That was Gustav Mie with the so-called Mie theory. And so we have actually two theories to um, use in our algorithm. The, the difference between the two is Fraunhofer's formula works perfectly fine. And large particles, of course, is a relative term. Uh, to give it a number, let's say anything above 10 micrometers, you don't even have to think about anything else. You can, with a very calm conscience, just use the Fraunhofer theory for the algorithm for your calculations. However, if you go and especially below one micrometer, so as soon as you enter the nanometer range, and this is no surprise because that is the uh, area of the wavelength of visible light, at that point, the Fraunhofer theory becomes very inexact. And at this point, you need basically to shift to the Mie theory. Now you could ask the question, why do we not always use Mie theory, even for the large ones? Because it also works for large particles. It's basically a general theory. But it has, compared to Fraunhofer, another disadvantage. In order to make good Mie calculation, you need material-specific parameters. In name, you need the refraction index of your liquid, your dispersion liquid, you need the refractive index of your particles, and you need the absorption coefficient of your particles. And you don't always know that. Basically, you never know that, really, because these parameters are still a matter of researchers all over the world to find these parameters. Uh, some do it the by theoretical calculations, others by experiments. So even the, the, in, in literature, the numbers just for a simple element is iron or silver, they, they vary a lot. But of course, uh, you just have to decide for one of those parameters to use and then just stick with it. The most important thing always when you do that is decide for one parameter and stick with it to make all of your measurements comparable. Uh, that's the most important thing. So here, you can definitely change things 
in the software and that is a little bit about the, what you said with the tuning so that's something you need to focus on then when you reach very very small particles by the way as we have this picture here uh, what you see here is uh, a scattering in nature so we have the sun the sunlight and uh, the sunbeams are scattered on the air molecules and that's why we see that ring uh, around the sun here so that is basically the the natural equivalent of our um, yeah, physical principle which we use. Uh, so once, as I said here, you see how it would look like. So once the particle size is really below your wavelength, um, you have to use me theory. You just have to go with, you have to find these parameters, decide for some kind of these parameters um, in order to get a good result. And very important, this can change your results drastically. So if you have the same sample, the same measurement even, so we have the opportunity in this instrument to take a measurement which we made and not make a new measurement for a new calculation, we just take the old raw data and we calculate them with different parameters. So you basically have the same raw data, you calculate it twice, only changing, for example, the optical constants for the me-scattering. That can change your result drastically. So there you will then see the importance of picking these me parameters, it is really not to be neglected. That is a very, very important part. And that's also, um, I can show you later uh, on the software live, I think it's better. You have an opportunity uh, not only to choose the formula, which to uh, use me or, or, or Fraunhofer, you can also um, influence the calculation model. So you can influence, I mean, at the end of the day, you will always get kind of a Gaussian curve. So if you do, for example, the direct measurement, yeah, uh, and you really have only one particle size on the tenth of a nanometer exactly, you will basically just get one very, very sharp peak, nothing else. That's a direct measurement. Uh, in an indirect measurement, you will never ever be able to obtain that. You will always have a little bit of a distribution. You will always have a Gaussian curve for the simple fact that you always use an algorithm. You always calculate your result. You don't measure your result, you calculate it. And that's why you always have this kind of a Gaussian curve. And there's also the opportunity in the software to determine a certain factor for smoothing. Yeah, so, for example, if you have a very, very broad distribution from one micrometer to one millimeter, you probably want to smooth that curve more because you don't want to have such a spiky curve. You want to have a nice smooth curve. While on the other hand, if you have an istraceable standard, something where you know it's all within uh, one, uh, at one micrometer plus minus maybe three, 30 nanometers, uh, you want a sharp peak. So you would use almost no smoothing. You would use the least amount of smoothing to get your peak as sharp as possible. So that is uh, one, one opportunity, or basically the two opportunities of yeah, tuning in the software or, or changing the way of calculating. First of all, selecting the correct theory or the appropriate theory, and then also uh, select an appropriate amount of smoothing for your curve. A lot of talking for a very simple question. Sorry, but it was a very good one to actually bring up this point. Okay, thank you. Is there any question? Thank you. So, I have two questions, and mm -hmm. I guess the first one, the answer will not depends because <laughs> it must be measured in the uh, equipment so how about the volume you you usually call it suspension right yes. so how about the volume of the suspension necessarily to be circulated in the equipment that is the first one uh -huh. and the second how about the volume of the cell right and then uh, the the second the next second is <laughs> the next second is uh, so it is so tempting for me to get the answer about the typical of uh, at least uh, for example you give us the range of the measurement I think about 0 0.01 micron up to about 3000 uh, micron right so uh, if there is a kind of typical uh, 
concentration. For example, ranging from uh, blah 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 PPB to blah 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 PPM, then it will be very helpful for us as a user while using this equipment. So, is there any uh, such typical uh, range for this equipment? Um, two very good questions. So the first one uh, I showed in this this unit I have here in this dispersion unit, you can tune the volume in, uh, of your dispersion bath between 150 ml to 500 ml. Uh, about the volume in the cell, actually I have to say I don't know. I just know that the cell width is 4 millimeters because the upper limit is 3.8 millimeters, so we have to get also these particles through the cell. Uh, we could simply calculate it. If we take the cell out and I know it's four millimeters wide, we could just measure it, uh, the other two dimensions, and then you have your, your um, volume of the cell. Nonetheless, it's a good question because sometimes you might have material uh, where you just have so little that even with 150 ml, you won't reach a sufficient concentration um, for a good measurement. So in that case, there is uh, separate dispersion unit, or actually it's not yet. Um, I mentioned the wet dispersion, which is there. I mentioned dry dispersion, which we don't have here. Uh, and there is a third one, which is called a cuvette. So that is something we're still working on. As I mentioned, this instrument was introduced in 2020, and when it was introduced, we only came out with the wet dispersion. So after that, we worked on a good dry dispersion, which has now hit the market uh, this year in June, and the next thing we're working on now is this kind of a cuvette dispersion, which is basically not a dispersion unit. So the cuvette is basically just the cell, and I think that points more in the direction of your question, the cell volume, because here it's not really critical, the cell volume, but for the cuvette it's critical because the cuvette is basically only the cell. And um, there you, basically, you just enter your sample in the cell and then it's really, there's no flow. You just let that sample sink in sediment um, and then you do the measurements while it sediments in that cuvette. So this would be the solution and there we talk about volumes of maybe somewhere from 5 to 20 milliliters in the cuvette. So as we still develop it, I cannot tell you what the final volume will be. But um, of course, it's a very different story than 150 ml. So that would be the solution for this kind of, of a challenge when you really have uh, such a small amount um, of material. And then the concentration, as I mentioned in the beginning, it depends on the particle size. So of course, if you tell me here I have uh, uh, 800 micrometer particles, uh, I can, I have a feeling maybe, yeah, when you give me the sample, I more or less know how much to add. But if you want me to tell you in numbers how much grams do I have to add, I could guess that. But for me, really, as I always enter the sample, it's more of a feeling. I could probably hit that pretty nicely when I do it. Um, but at the end of the day, the general rule is the, the bigger your particles, the more you'll need. So if it's a one millimeter particles, it's probably um, a gram. If it's uh, 10 micrometers, it's probably 60 milligram. Um, but about these typical measuring ranges. I think that was the last part of your question. That's also one that I really like. Uh, because if we talk about um, the measuring range, ah, I don't have to show it. I mean, it's just a number, 3,800, as you uh, correctly mentioned. To be perfectly honest, um, if you would approach me with a request uh, for the laser particle sizer and you tell me uh, that your sample has a size of one to three millimeters. I would not sell you this equipment. I could, would recommend you something else. And the simple reason is one millimeter is already a size where we can perform a direct measurement. So why perform an indirect measurement when you can actually perform a direct measurement? Um, the reason why we have to go up in such high uh, amounts. Our previous instrument had an upper measuring limit of two millimeters, which is absolutely enough, in fact. For the technique itself, it's enough. That's why we build it that way, because nobody will measure particles bigger than two millimeters with a laser particle sizer. It makes no sense. But then uh, how life always goes, you know, some competitors, they built machines and they made the upper limit 3,500, and then they put this into a public tender, 
your upper limit is two millimeters, you're out of the public tender. Although probably the sample in the tender is only 10 micrometers, so nobody actually cares, but it, it is a way, you know, the different um, manufacturers fight for, for lockout specs. So basically, the, the main competitor, which always had 3.5, that's the reason why we have 3.8 millimeters. It actually has nothing to do with measuring. It works, of course. I mean, we don't uh, bring something on the market when it doesn't work. But it's absolutely nonsense to do it. The only reason we build it that way is to have the lockouts back. It's not an invention by us. It's not something we want to do. It's something that everybody does. At some point, you have to play the game. So um, that's the main reason for that. If you had a sample of uh, one to two millimeters or one to three millimeters, I would recommend you the instrument we saw at the very beginning uh, quite quickly, the dynamic image analysis. So that is an instrument we have where you basically, for more coarse powders, you feed them through a measuring zone, a continuous feed, not a closed loop. And we have a flashlight, we have a camera, and we make up to 75 frames per second. And then uh, in the software, all of those pictures, um, the particle size of every single particle on the picture is calculated. And we also have there the opportunity to get information about the shape, not only the size. So the dynamic image analysis, which is the NLZ28, would in that case be the instrument that I would recommend you. OK, thank you for the question. Is there any question because we still have a spare time? So please. Better ask, otherwise I will start asking questions. <laughs> or uh, is there any other slide you want to show to us? Or is um, it enough? What we can do, I mean, I just explained about the, the dynamic image analysis, so why not uh, give you an idea of how it works real quick? Because I think there's even a video animation um, of the whole process. Um, yeah. So here you see the schematic setup of this image analysis, which is the second instrument in our portfolio regarding particle sizing. Uh, you enter your material into this funnel. You have a feeder, which is mounted on a vibratory motor. So that way, once switched on, it will feed your sample this way. Um, there are two settings for this feeder. So you basically can change the frequency and also the power. And the nice thing is the power is adjustable by the software. So you can actually set a certain density of material. It will fall down here. And you have a flashlight, you have a camera. So here the particles are detected falling down. You can actually automate the feeding speed by the power being automatically adjusted in the software. And then your sample is collected down here. And your data uh, will come up in your software. So uh, as a video, um, to have a look at this, how it looks. Uh, actually, I can use this. I don't have to use that. Oh, why did the video not start? Let's see. Hmm. Let's see if it starts that way. Yes, now it started. So that's uh, how it will look. You feed the material. Um, it will fall down in that measuring zone. And then as you can see here with the up to 75 uh, frames per second, pictures are taken. And these pictures then are used by the software to determine the size and also the shape of the particles. So that would be um, something you could use for more coarse particles. Of course, there are some conditions as well. Um, these particles should be free flowing. So again, if we have for the dry measurement any kind of moisture, or uh, especially below 100 micrometers, it becomes critical because electrostatic forces will play a role. And electrostatic forces can lead to your small particles really sticking together, and there is no real dispersion for this instrument, especially in the dry mode. You can actually use this wet dispersion unit, which you see in the back, and use a special measuring cell for the NLZ28 and also do a wet measurement with this instrument, because then 
uh, this problem with humidity or electrostatic forces is basically eliminated. And that way you can make also a wet measurement with the image analysis. Uh, we do actually have customers, uh, especially universities, especially ge geological institute uh, in Germany, in Slovenia, in Finland, uh, soon in Egypt, where they use, bo use both instruments. It's, it's not really designed that way, but it works that you can use um, or, or basically make it yourself. You buy both cells. Uh, we will give you enough hoses, and then you just build a, a cycle where you transport the material or your sample through the laser, and then through the image analysis, and you measure the same sample at the same time with both instruments. So there are about three or four customers who actually do that, um, mostly in universities. So that would also be uh, an option to go for. Um, unfortunately, I mean, this is actually, I really like this uh, device because maybe I even have that here somewhere. Um, Let's see if we have software. Uh, the thing I like about this device a lot is, first of all, well, it's not in there, unfortunately. Uh, you can use it for shape parameters as well. So you can determine, is my particle round? Is my particle long? Or whatever. And my most favorite thing of this instrument and this software is the following. Uh, somewhere must be. Fortunately, not in here. Then I might just want to explain that. So what the software is capable to do, as this is a direct measurement, image analysis, um, you can create a chart in this software and plot two parameters against, ah, there it is, perfect. I need to still, ah disabled so I need to enable the slide first so if we look at this um, it's a rather old picture of the software it's our own in-house programmed software so now it looks quite different a lot better but what you see here is we put one parameter on the x-axis and we put another parameter in this case circularity on the y-axis so by plotting the two parameters against another, we can get a correlation, visual, a visual correlation of the size and the roundness in this example. Now the very, very nice thing, which I really, really love about this instrument, about this software, is the following. You can look at such a particle cloud in this plot where every dot represents one single particle. No matter if you measure 10 million particles, which will bring the computer power to its limits, but still you can measure 10 million particles and you'll get 10 million dots here. For each particle, you will exactly see where it's located. And the thing that really sets this instrument apart from anything that I know, maybe you know something where that works, um, then tell me, but for me it's the, really the only technique I know where now if we save every single image, what we can do is we can check this cloud. And for example, here I would say the first thing I observe is, yeah, we have here is the main spot of particles. This could be dust, for example, because, yeah, you see the, the so we, let's, let's disregard this for, for an instance. But I see here, there's kind of a line with only purple par particles, only particles uh, from the measurement, the purple measurement, which are here on one line, pretty much far apart from the main cloud. And what I can do now in this software is I can double click on this particle and it shows me the picture of that particle. I can double click on this one, I can double click on that one, I can double click on this one. So this is the only technique where I can actually visualize a measurement error. Because what I might find is here, this is pretty big and is not very round. So it could very likely be the case that I have this particle and this particle and they keep falling and they fell like this and are detected as one. So maybe I observe that and then I can filter these particles out so I can actually do very intensive research and which line, maybe here, at which parallel line does the measurement error start to be dominant and where is it to be neglected. And then I can, for example, filter that in my software and that way 
I can directly influence and improve on a measurement error. So that is actually really the thing I absolutely love about this instrument because it also gives you a feel for your measurement. Because anything that you see in data, you can directly visualize, which is quite unique. So um, this is really something very, very nice. But on the other hand, of course, you have to take into account measuring range with the laser particle size that you can go much further down being an indirect method. So here you're really limited to around uh, 10 to 20 micrometers, which is already borderline. You will not get real good shape information anymore in a 20 micrometer particle. You'll see there is something because it's a couple of pixels, but shape information will be very limited. But anyhow, this feature is one that I really, really love. And I really love to work with this with new samples because uh, you can really improve your measurement process here uh, by using this cloud. So. OK, is there any question? OK, so this is the end of the first session. Once more, give a big applause to Mr. Mike for his greatly explanation. Don't forget, we still have the second session this afternoon. For now, everyone can take a break for about one and a half hour. Uh, maybe that's all from me. Thank you, and see you at 1 p.m. Thank you. So we're like 15 minutes early, that's OK. <laughs> huh? Yeah, yeah, it's difficult to hit the, the spot on the minute. Yeah.